Well, good evening, or in the case of you elsewhere in the world, good morning or, or, or good afternoon. Uh, and welcome to what I believe is the 10th, uh, more or less monthly meeting of the History of the Printed Image Network. Um, a very high standard has been set by previous speakers, and, and uh, I think that you'll find that this will be kept up this evening by the two speakers we've got. Um, just a word of the way we're going to run things. The two speakers will each give their presentations, which will last about an hour and a half each. Uh, sorry, about half an hour each. Uh, moments panic there on Elisa's face. Uh, and then we'll take all the questions and answers uh, at the end. And we've got about half an hour for that. Please put your any questions you have in the questions and answer box, not in the chat box. Reserve that purely for greetings, comments, or other things. If by any chance we run out of time, because we have to finish at 6.30 English time, um, then the uh, speakers will, if possible, contact you by email and answer your questions. So tonight we have got Elisa Marazzi and, Bar Elisa Marazzi and Larissa Velhina, and um, they're giving us two papers on not interrelated, mostly interrelated subjects. Um, the first speaker is Elisa. She's a senior researcher in book history at Milan University. Her research is focused on illustrated printed items that were largely available in past societies and thus played an important role in the everyday lives of people. She has recently completed a Maria Swadowska Curie Fellowship at Newcastle University aimed at researching children and transitional popular print from 1700 to 1900. And she's going to address us on the subject of penny prints, lotteries, etc., juvenile illustrated broadsides in Europe and beyond, 1700 to 1900. So over to you, Elisa. Thank you, thank you, Barry. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, while I share my screen, I have a request for you all, which is to bear with my English. Um, I have been, uh, it's been uh, eight months since I left, uh, I've moved back to Italy, and I feel my uh, English is already vanishing, but I hope you will be patient, and if you don't understand, just ask me to repeat. Okay, I am now sharing my screen, I hope. Okay, it seems to be working. Okay, so I am very happy and thankful for the possibility to present in front of an audience that does not completely coincide with my research field, which is mainly book history, as I believe that your inputs and comments will be much valuable. Today, I will present on the transnational history of illustrated broadsides in Western Europe in 18th and 19th centuries, with some incursions outside Europe. The geographical focus was chosen for two main reasons. It is the focus of a now formally concluded, but still very much in progress, Marie Skrudowska Curie project at Newcastle University, and the funder is the EU. So that is one reason why I'm focusing on Europe. Moreover, uh, the languages of Western Europe are somewhat intelligible to me. Uh, so uh, that is why I chose this uh, focus. The history of uh, juvenile ephemera is well rooted in a tradition of pictorial broadsides uh, widespread throughout Western Europe in formats and contents uh, that uh, although varied, are often surprisingly similar in regions uh, even far apart. In the 19th century, Western Europe and the Americas were literally inundated by broadsides carrying a series of woodcuts uh, described by short rhyming letterpress captions. It has been argued that such prints are the origins of the comic strip, uh, but influences are indeed manifold. I shall hence leave this intricate matter to specialists of the field. I will rather describe and discuss the encounters of children with this kind of uh, printed items, focusing on uh, such materials that I call uh, broads illustrated broadsides. This includes, but is not limited to, what in English is known as catch penny prints or simply penny prints. 
Looking at the production of the 17th century English intaglio printers, Jill Sheffrin has argued that if we include pictorial prints in the history of juvenile books, we could backdate by almost a century the emergence of children as an audience for the English publishing business. In this talk, I will discuss evidence from many areas of Europe showing how, although at different times in different regions, illustrated prints, already a staple of the cheap print trade, were often a driver for the development of printed products for children. As I said, the formats and contents were varied. However, by the half of the 19th century, a standard format took code of the market. Uh, across the Western world. It was a single sheets uh, measuring uh, on average uh, 40 centimeters in height and 30 centimeters in, in width. Um, often it was the half of a printing sheet and they were uh, conceived to be read in a portrait format. They narrated stories through a sequence of vignettes arranged in a variable numbers of rows and columns, hence the similarity with comics. The vignettes were printed by woodblocks, which very much influenced this layout. However, in some regions, especially Britain and Italy, intaglio printing was the main method. They could be black and white, dub colored, printed on colored papers, paper, or later on also color printed. But in all cases, they were printed on one side of a single sheet, of a half of a single sheet. Their simple materiality, combined with the very high print runs, led to their cheapness. In some cases, towards the end of the 19th century, some of them were even di distributed for free as they carried advertisements, either in the blanks of the page or uh, in the verso of the page of the sheet. Such prints uh, are known Apologies, I'm just coming back later. Hanon um, with different names in many different areas. Catchpenny or lottery prints, Sense Printen in the Dutch countries. Uh, apologies for the pronunciation, I kind of read uh, Dutch, but uh, um, I can't speak it. Bilderbogen in Germany, Pliegos de Alleluias in Spanish, and Planche d'Imagerie or Feuille d'Imagerie in France, just to mention the more established. These uh, broadsides have been the object of specialized studies on a regional and national basis, and more recently, scholars have started to study them in a transnational perspective as well. Given their attractive appearance and their hybrid status at the crossroads between uh, bibliographical materials and graphics, they had also been showcased in exhibition and illustrated publications. What has emerged uh, from research and publication and exhibition and publication is their wide circulation throughout the society that has led historians to define them an early modern mass medium. This was also suggested by some coeval observers, uh, such as uh, uh, Theodor Fontane, who rhetorically wondered what is the uh, quote, what is the fame of the times compared to the civilizing task accomplished by the Bilderbogen from Neuruppin referring to the prints from uh, Neuruping, the German best known publishing center for these materials. Uh, broad sites were a profitable business uh, for many reasons. Non-prescriptiveness seems to be an attractive feature of these prints that could be read, but also just looked at or used as cutout sheets to play with. With illustrations prevailing on text, these materials could also attract illiterates or semi-literates, including children from any background. Indeed, illustrated broadsides were possibly the most crossover subgenre of cheap print, being equally familiar to and enjoyed by the young and the old. Religious prints in various formats represented a relevant part of the production of cheap print in the cities and, and, and provincial towns of France, Germany, Italy from the 17th and 18th centuries. This was also the case in England, as argued by Tessa Watts, although material evidence is scarce. Secular illustrated broadsides were also produced across Europe, and it is on these kinds of prints that I will focus. In some areas, as France and Italy, before the 19th century, they were probably printed in smaller numbers compared to religious subjects, as emerged from catalogs and archival records of some printers. In the Netherlands, the area for which more accurate records are available, from the 1660s, the secular themes outnumbered religious subjects, in particular in the northern provinces. 
where a sustained study of secular illustrated print already exists, scholars have tried different classification systems in order to manage this multifarious matter. Primarily based on the contents of the ship preserved or of those that we know were published when evidence is available. Scholars have stressed how this matter is difficult to contain in a scheme and came to the conclusion that cheap print represent a sort of open-ended visual encyclopedia in loose sheets. In some prints, the encyclopedic aim was obvious, for instance, in sheets representing animals, birds, plants, historical figures, cities, traditional costumes, uh, types of craftsmanship, street sellers, uh, types of popular entertainment, dance, and so forth. Other prints had a more narrative purpose, proposing illustrated version of folk tales, fables, and fairy tales. Apologies, I'm going back. More canonical literature uh, was also present in sheets that proposed the visual versions of literary works and theater plays. There were also satirical and numerous prints. Playful and entertaining use was often mixed with didactic and moralizing purposes. In some cases, printers of illustrated materials were among the first to address children explicitly, as you will see here. Um, see here, O oh Young Children, this is the opening line of um, a Dutch sense print issued in the 18th century, and it was indeed quite common together with the other expressions addressing children or kinder. Uh, this suggests the interest, the interest of publishers for a juvenile audience um, wider than elsewhere uh, on the continent uh, due to widespread literacy and good spending possibilities. We have to remember that this happened in an area with little or ineffective censorship uh, on printed products, great paper availability, and also of a diversification of printed products available so that adults uh, probably shifted to other forms of cultural consumption and publishers of more traditional items had to find new strategies if they wanted to survive. The subjects of these early prints addressed to children were profane and often more narrative. This changed partially with the foundation of the Society for Common Benefit in 1784, which inundated the market with edifying penny prints to be used in schools. In the words of Gomez and Salman, who has recently started comparatively, comparatively um, Dutch and Spanish uh, penny prints, uh, the Dutch penny prints uh, in, uh, at the end of the 18th century evolved into the epitome of educational reform. In the 19th century, the core of the production uh, moved to the Southern Netherlands, today's Belgium, where Brepols and other printers based in Turnout became the main publishers of Sense Printen. By this time, the production had definitely become widely addressed to children, although we cannot rule out that adults enjoyed pen prints as well, especially as some sat satiric themes survived as the land of cocaine. Throughout my research on children and cheap print, it has emerged that Dutch and English publishers were often the pioneers in experimenting for juvenile audiences. In the case of broadsides for England, Tessa Watt and Sheila O'Connell have discussed that printed sheets, uh, illustrated sheets, were printed um, mainly through copper plates, these resulting in lower print rounds that don't allow to assess how widely they circulated. However, England wasn't backwards in the adaptation of intaglio broadsides to children, as we will see in the second part of my talk. But first, a brief reflection is needed about Spain. Dutch and Spanish illustrated broadsides have been described, as I said, in a comparative perspective by Gomez and Salman for their extraordinary relevance in the print culture of the two areas. It is not clear how much this situation depended on the political and commercial links between the two areas in the 16th century. What is sure is that Spain, where children's books started to be issued comparatively, um, comparatively late, sorry, um, I, uh, that is in the late 19th century, Alleluias are the printed items possibly closer to children from a very early date. Carmen Bravo Villasante has seen Alleluias as a sort of archaeology of children's literature, whereas, according to more cautious scholars, there is little evidence that Alleluias were deliberately designed for juvenile audience, at least in the early days. 
As it often happens, the truth probably lies somewhere in the middle, with the alleluias being surely attractive to children, although probably initially designed without a specific target audience due to the lack of a secure market of young readers in a comparatively less literate region of Europe. The juvenile destination of Alleluias becomes more retraceable in the 19th century when the production of uh, such broadsides bloomed. Traditionally, uh, a production of Catalan cities, they were brought successfully to Madrid in mid 19th century. In the debate on the juvenile uses of Alleluias, some authors stress that in Spain, stories by the 19th century standardized as for children Perrault fables, for instance, to make just one example, such stories were not the object of Alleluia's printed locally. Fables and fairy tales for children circulated in Spain through pictorial broadsides printed by French publishers. In the second half of the 19th century, the French Pellerin print shop, print shop was in fact in the process of setting up a global business by the means of serialization and technological innovation a global business that also reached Latin America. That is probably the main reason why Pelerin also printed in Spain, in Spanish. Pelerin is probably the best known um, business um, of printed images, for d'image, uh, in France. It was based in Epinal, a town in the Vosges that has become the symbol of European illustrated broadsides as far as the 19th century is concerned. What was so special, special in this small uh, Lorenese town? The business of printing illustrations and playing cards through woodblocks started in Epinal in the 17th century, and it soon after transitioned to printing images, mainly religious. However, the fame of the town is due to Jean-Charles Pellerin, an engraver that opened his print shop around 1800 and soon was able to adopt new technologies such as metal stereotypes to improve his business. Images printed in the first decades of Pellerin's activities, both sacred and profane, were usually organized with a big woodcut in the middle and a relatively long text to the side. The repertory was that of pop the popular encyclopedia in loose sheets already discussed. In 1822, uh, Jean Charles' son, Nicolas, Nicolas inherited, inherited the print shop and uh, with this business partner decided to explicitly address children. It is not clear whether the choice of using uh, the, sequen the sequence of vignettes format, uh, probably taking inspiration from the sheets already circulating in neighboring areas, went hand in hand with the deliberate will of printing for the young. However, both choices can be dated to the 1830s and were soon followed by the adoption of lithography. Epinal was not the only French center devoted to cheap roadsides uh, increasingly addressed to children. Wenzel, based in Wissenburg, a town at the current border with Germany and France, was also relevant in the market, as well as other towns. Although Wenzel from Wissenburg uh, printed also in German, the demand must have been far from um, satisfied by uh, French uh, printer, as, so, as shown by the success of Neuruppiner Bilderbogen, that is, Bilderbogen printed in Neuruppin, as mentioned before, a town in East Germany, Eastern Germany. Non-expert of cheap print might have heard about the Münchener Bilderbogen, which have been argued to be a sort of incunabula of comics and were designed by renowned artists such as Megan Dorfer, just to make an example. Earlier than this, the term, the term Bilderbogen was used to describe any illustrated publication in loose sheets and then labeled specifically a series of pictorial broadsides printed by Kuhn in Neuruppin, as the one that you can see. Bilderbogen are nowadays preserved mainly in albums. Indeed, when the evolution of printing techniques allowed, especially after the establishment of lithography, publishers soon capitalized on broadsides benefiting from a developing feature of the publishing market, serialization. In many regions, broadsides could be sold as loose items, as well as part of collectible series, as well as albums. This made them accessible to all budgets, but also encouraged the purchaser's loyalty. Another enlightening feature of these now, um, these new juvenile, bro now juvenile broadsides is the inter intersections between oral and printed word. 
I wish I had more time to deal with the pictorial broadside uh, that uh, uh, depicted the international version of the cries of theme, as you can see here. But perhaps this is going to be a topic for a new hoping talk. Let's hope so. However, what I want to say on reality is that by mid 19th century, uh, the predominant format of a sequence of vignettes featured the rhyming captions all over the continent. Unsurprisingly, as rhyme is not only pleasant and entertaining for both young and adults, but also enhances learning processes. Rhyme might also have been a useful aid for autodidacts or school pupils that were learning the rudiments of reading, and some broadsides were increasingly printed for such purposes. Heading toward the second and shorter part of my talk, let me draw a first conclusion. During the 19th century, the focus of printers of cheap prints uh, became stronger on, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the focus on children of printer of, print, of cheap print and of illustrated broadsides broad became stronger. This was reinforced by an extensive production of cheap do-it-yourself paper toys printed on broadsides, to which I will devote the second part of my talk. Pictorial broadsides have always had interactive and playful uses. Besides being used as the board for board games, other interactive uses that implied cutting out from the sheet, cutting figures out of from the sheet, are attested in the Dutch area from the 17th century. Uh, they are called billets de roi. These were cutout cards used for a role play game played on Epiphany. Spanish Alleluias originated also from small cards to be cut out from broadsides and thrown on religious processions. In England and Scotland, but also in the Netherlands, pictures cut out from broadsides known as lotteries or dubbities were used to play for, for playing purposes. Here um, we can see the intaglio printed items from the English speaking world that I mentioned earlier. Figures cut out from such broadsides could be hidden between the pages of a booklet as testified by this painting, a detail of a painting, a well-known painting. Children would then slide a pin between the pages where they had previously uh, hidden the figures, uh, the, the images. If by doing so, they found a picture, they won it. Sometimes sheet published in the 19th century were deliberately printed for a playful use as lottery games. We have here three examples. In the Catholic world, broadsides allowing to build do-it-yourself nativity scenes were already successful in the 18th century. Here, the principle was to paste a broadside um, illustrated with appropriate landscapes and figures on thick paper or cardboard. After doing so, the scenery and characters of the scene were cut out and, were necessary, folded to build a three-dimensional paper crib. Broadsides depicting, um, containing small depiction of soldiers were also successful do-it-yourself paper toys from the late 18th century. Moreover, cutting out figures from broadsides was already in use for decorating purposes. Many printers sold sheets for lacquering. The same principle could be used for any purpose, and so it was. A wide range of paper soldiers, but also of dolls, theaters, and construction toys started to appear in the form of illustrated broadsides from the 1850s. It can be argued that printers of cheap illustrated broadsides started to renovate their stocks when inspired by publishers specializing uh, in books for better off children. In the second half of the 19th century, a series of broadsides issued by Pellerin, Kuhn, and other colleagues increasingly includes, include do-it-yourself paper dolls, theaters, shows, and so on. Illustrated broadside thus made available to a wider audience what we can call the highlight of the Victorian novelty. The latter had, of course, already been copied by continental publishers of books for children and toys for the upper end of the market, so that the production of both refined toy books and broadsides containing paper toys flourished across Europe. This happened through practices that we would nowadays define as piracy. However, copying ideas was quite the norm in the absence of international copyright laws. 
Also in this case, serial serialization was highly exploited. In order to build, for instance, a paper theater, children or their parents had to purchase more than a broadside. Shadow light theater games were perhaps the most popular form of um, paper toy that was disseminated through broadsides. Also in this case, printers put in place interesting strategies offering a range of products that catered for different levels of the market. The offer was nothing compared to the levels of elaboration that shadow light toys and toy books could reach. However, it provided basic paper toys to children from social classes that hadn't previously been addressed by toy manufacturers. As a corollary of this, the success of shadow light theater games raises further awareness on the necessity to link scholarship on interactive printed artifacts and toy books with pre-cinema. Not by chance, already in the late 18th century, many purveyors of popular broadsides specialized in optical views and prints for peep shows, a form of entertainment that attracted children as attested by many coeval depictions. Also in England, the homeland of expensive novelties, cheaper versions of paper toys were available. Harry Mayhew, author of the famous account of street life in London in the 19th century, testified that working class men, in particular mechanics, used to buy engraved sheets, quote, for the amusement of their families, end of quote. Titles such as Optical and Mag Magical Delusions and Magical Figures are described by Mayhew as a, uh, quote, rude street imitations of D. Paris's ingenious toy called the Thomas Cope, end of, score, end of quote. Unfortunately, preservation rates for pictorial broadsides in the English-speaking countries are disappointingly low, which makes it difficult to properly include Britain in a trans-European history of um, illustrated broadside and cheap paper toys. In continental Europe, using the same pace and cut method, children could build, for instance, the Ogre's Palace for the story of Little Thumb or Bluebeard's Castle. Other series of construction sheets allowed purchasers to, buy, to build the paper miniatures of uh, newly built monuments, of trains, or other means of transport, and even of industrial exposition. This is another evidence of uh, the fact that these materials were sort of crossed over and could attract uh, adults as well. It's a strategy that might suggest that publishers in some areas do not feel very safe when segmenting the audience and addressing only children. These construction broadsides are an interesting example yet to be investigated of how the material culture of the late 19th century could uh, reflect the equivalent spirit of confidence in technological progress disseminated, as we already know, through illustrated broadsides as much as books, periodical, and so on. Since I am almost running out of time, uh, I actually have to confess that I have more questions than conclusion. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed this outline and I don't want to bother you with this question. I, and I'm all ears for your remarks uh, and suggestions that will be very welcome. Thank you very much for your patience. Well, thank you so much, Elisa. I'm sure that's going to uh, elicit a number of questions. Um, I've certainly got one or two comments to make when the time's appropriate. Um, but without any more ado, we'll straight go straight on to Larissa Vujena. <clears throat> she is a doctoral candidate in Irish Research Council Government of Ireland postgraduate scholar in the Department of History of Art at Trinity College Dublin. A current area of research includes Moxham's Tennyson, Victorian illustration, and Pre-Raphaelite art. So without any more ado, Larissa, over to you. Thank you very, Thank you much. very much. I'll share my screen. Right, so thank you very much. And um, I would like to start by uh, reading the title of my talk today. It's a new methodology to study the design and the engraving in the Mox and Tennyson 1857. And here's my agenda. I will first talk about the, vo the volume. Then I will go for the prior scholarship and traditional criticism of the illustration. And uh, after that, I'm gonna get a couple of examples uh, of this new methodology. So, 
This presentation is about the illustration in the 1857 illustrated poems, more commonly known as the Moxon Tennyson or Moxon, by English poet Alfred Tennyson, published by Edward Moxon. And the volume comprises a selection of poems from previously published works by Tennyson. The 1857 edition has 375 pages and a total of 80 poems. Almost half, half of it, of all of them, are accompanied by illustrations of varying dimensions. Of the 54 illustrations in the book, 24 were designed by leading artists of the day, including five academicians, namely the British artists Clarkson Frederick Stanfield, Thomas Creswick, and John Calcutt Horsley, as well as the Irish artists William O'Reedy and Daniel McLeese. The remaining 30 illustrations were created by three younger artists, the Pre-Raphaelites William Holman Hunt, Dante Gaber Rossetti, and John Everett Millet. The monks and drawings were con converted into wood engravings by six established engravers, namely the Dazi brothers, William James Linton, Thomas Williams, John Thompson, his son Charles Thompson, and W.T. Green. The Mox and Tennyson was published in May 1857. Today, the volume is regarded as a landmark in Victorian illustration on account of its aesthetic di diversity, which was highly unique in the, in the history of 19th century illustration. Now I'd like to turn to the prior scholarship and traditional criticism of the volume. The multiplicity of illustrating styles in the Mox and Tennyson has posed a challenge to scholars, resulting in limitations in terms of both research and methodology. An issue relates to the lack of published research on the Mox and illustration conducted from a visual, cultural, or art historical perspective. To date, the most important contributions to the study of the Mox and illustration have been made by scholars in the fields of literary criticism, illustration, visual culture, cultural history, and the best known figures are those that have published critical research into the Moxon. Some of the names are Professor of English Lorraine Jansen Kolstra, Professor of English Literature Julius Th Julia Thomas, cultural historian Jim Cheshire, and literary critic and Victorian illustration expert Simon Cook. So I here propose a new methodology to study the illustration. This paper recognizes a deficiency in the multidisciplinary research in the Moxon illustration. Although the scholars studying the Moxon come from a variety of disciplines, no major contribution has been made regarding the illustration within the field of visual code, culture or art history. This fact has led to a unidirectional flow permeating the analysis into the illustration and poetry relationship, which begins with a word and then addresses the image. It places the illustration as a secondary source dependent on the poetry to a greater or lesser extent. So far, the methodology has tended to adopt two key terms in the process, whereas literal has been used to denote the images that are rather faithful to the text, interpretive illustration is then used to label designs that add their own interpretation to the verbal source. This paper disputes these long established research patterns and methodologies stemming from various disciplines other than that of visual culture or art history. Its aim today is to put forward a new methodology which has a visual viewpoint, placing the illustration first and starting with illustration as the, the analysis and then going from there to anal analysis of the relationship between image and text. I would like to start with my first case. The illustration for Tennyson's Mariana in the South. The Mox and Tennyson illustration for Mariana in the South is a wood engraving by William James Linton on the right. After Dante Gabriel Rossetti's drawing, which we can see on the left. The drawing is in turn based on a study by Rossetti, which is kept in the collection of fine arts and drawings at Birmingham Museums. And you can see that here. In the engraving, Mariana is depicted in profile in front of a crucifix, leaning forward and kissing Christ's foot. Her hands are firmly holding two ladders, with several more lying on her lap and others scattered over the floor. She is wearing a long cloak falling around her. Her long straight hair flows down her back, reflected in the tilted mirror to the right, in which the upper part of the cross is visible. The room appears to be a sacristy in a church, as is evident from the shallow basin built in the niche wall to the left. At the back of the room is a large window with securely closed wooden shutters. 
Rosetta's picture functions as a visual source that informs the reading of the poem. Before reading the text, the viewer and reader is introduced to the figure of Mariana, who is presented as a religious woman worshiping Christ represented by the crucifixion sculpture. With her eyes shut, Mariana seems oblivious to her surroundings, while the viewer can scrutinize the details in the setting. Turning to the poem, Mariana in the South by Alfred Tennyson, it was first published about 25 years before the design was made, and it was revised in 1842. It presents the central theme of solitude felt through the perception of senses. It presents eight stanzas, each with 12 lines following the same alternating rhyming scheme. The refrain is usually found in the last four lines of each stanza in which Mariana's voice is heard. The repetition of the words night and morn strengthens her agony and recurring words like alone, forgotten, forlorn, describe the state in which she finds herself. She has been forsaken and is now on her own, pitifully sad and lonely. In both the poem and the illustration, there's a clear focus on the protagonist Mariana. However, Tennyson and Rosetti remove her from the context of Shakespeare's play, Measure for Measure, in which she's only a supporting character and they make her the leading figure. In the poem, Mariana is in a house which is close latticed, as you can see here in the poem highlighted. This isolates the inner space from the outside. In the engraving, the room appears to be a sacristy. The window firmly shut in the back communicates the same idea of isolation present in the poem. Neither Mariana nor the viewer can see the outside world. As a result, the viewer is invited to enter the solitary world of Mariana, which is the main theme in both Rosetta's picture and Tennyson's poem. Besides the key theme of loneliness, the religious aspect dominates the illustration. The figure of Mariana is kneeling at the foot of the cross, kissing Christ's feet as a sign of her devotion and belief. The crucifixion does not stem from Tennyson's text though. Tennyson's character is praying to the Virgin Mary. Quote, low on her knees, herself she cast, before Our Lady murmured she, complaining mother give me grace to help me of my weary load, unquote. The Marian component of the poem can be seen in the figure of Mariana herself as designed by Rosetti. Her ample cloak with a hood and the pronounced folds in the fabric resemble Albrecht Dürer's depiction of Mary's garment in his woodcut titled Madonna on the Crescent as part of the series The Life of the Virgin from 1511. The sharp contrast of light and dark in Mariana's clothes achieved by Rosetti's handling of the pen is similar to Dürer's treatment of Mary's garment by cutting into the wood block. Rosetti's draws, Rosetti draws on Dürer's skillful use of contours composed of short yet thick lines cut in various directions around which hatching has been applied. Whereas Dürer makes use of gradient shading in a complex arrangement of drapery, Rosetti's heavy ink strokes remain visible in the darker areas achieved by hatching and cross hatching. Turning to Linton's engraving on the far right, there is a slightly softer application of contour lines than in Rosetti's drawing, especially in the region around Mariana's waist and legs. Nevertheless, the result in all three cases is a complex play of shadow and light, creating the illusion of three-dimensionality. Despite the two different printmaking techniques, both Dürer's woodcut on the left and Linton's wood engraving on the right share commonalities in their approach to cutting the garment folds into the woodblock. Dürer's emphasis on the treatment of drapery can be linked to the significant role that cloths and clothing played during the Renaissance. New social practices for special occasions, such as weddings and baptisms, required an ever-changing world of draperies, which in turn served as new sources of inspiration for painters and engravers. As an artist working in the mediums of drawing, painting, and printmaking, Dürer acknowledged the importance of depicting folds and cloths by adopting a novel approach combined with his own visual imagination. His drapery compositions were careful, carefully studied and painstakingly converted into woodcuts in order to communicate volume, shading, 
and depth in an unprecedented manner. Rossetti would have been familiar with the Renaissance tradition of rendering drapery from his substantial exposure to Renaissance art at the National Gallery in London. In addition, Rossetti drew inspiration for the background from another woodcut from the same series by Durer, titled The Birth of the Virgin from around 1503. Rossetti borrowed from Durer's composition and furnishings along the entire wall, such as we can see the rug or the towel hanging from a bar, the sink within the niche in the back, and the stairs leading to a higher level, and finally the windows closed with shutters in the very back. By sourcing his design from Durer's woodcuts for the life of the Virgin, Rossetti was adding Mary in a less overt way, not by means of a statue of the Virgin, but rather by turning to an earlier print. In other words, Rossetti's design is not a literal one with regard to the poem, as it is not faithful to the text, which features the Virgin instead, but rather it cites her from a visual source, Durer's woodcut. Rosetta's substitution of Christ for his mother Mary serves to emphasize the redemptive nature of religious idolatry. In the illustration, Mariana is looking down with her head tilted backward. Her vacant gaze takes on two new meanings. The first one can be linked to Mar Mariana's misery. Her blank stare remains locked upon the sculpture, creating a static, almost frozen, upper left corner of the picture. This contrasts well with the lower left corner in which a group of letters spread on her clothes are rendered in various shapes in a disorganized manner, giving the viewer a sense of dynamism. Rosetti's addition of the letters refers to the following lines in the poem, quote, and rising from her bosom drew old letters breathing of her worth, for love they said must needs be true to what is loveliest upon earth, unquote. In the drawing, Mariana has been rereading those letters as she now crumples two of them in her hands. Tennyson's words reveal that these are love letters, which once brought Mariana happiness, but now they are the cause of her sorrow. Rosetti portrays Mariana in a state of low mood, conforming to the character's feelings. In the poem, quote, she, as her carol setter grew from brow and bosom slowly down, unquote. The second meaning evoked by Mariana's gaze is that of sexual desire. This is absent from Rosetti's first study, but can be seen in both his drawing and the engraving by Linton on the right. In both Mariana's lidded eye is reinforced by her lustful glance while kissing the feet of the crucifix. Despite it being reinforced, despite it being a relatively minor modification, the artist managed to impart a sense of not only intimate connection, but also eroticism. After being abandoned by her lover, Mariana now turns to religious worship with hopes of finding solace in her own devotion. However, she still harbors romantic feelings, which are combined with a completely new sexual component brought in by the artist in the medium of drawing, which is transmitted to the wood engraving. In Tennyson's verse, there is sadness in her look, in the line, quote, her melancholy eyes divine, unquote. By contrast, in the illustration, Mariana is still yearning for her lost love, both romantically and sexually. The analysis of the illustration for Tennyson's poem, Mariana in the South, reveals crucial visual evidence regarding the relationship between image and text. Isolated in an enclosed space, both Marianas are cut off from the real world. Whereas in Tennyson's text, Mariana's praying to the Virgin Mary, a crucifix takes place of Madonna in the picture. Nevertheless, the Marian component present in the picture, in the poem, sorry, is transferred to Rosetta's design in a new shape. It can be seen in the deeply creased garment of Our Lady, borrowed from Durer's woodcuts for the Life of the Virgin series. Linton's wood engraving returns to a more gradual blending of the dark contour lines. However, the lines cut into the wood block by the engraver are more distinct and thicker than those in the original woodcut by Durer. Durer's woodcuts for Life in the Virgin series also served as, as visual sources for the depiction in the background. By including a pictorial allusion to Mary, Rosetti references the repeated calls for the Virgin Mary by Mariana throughout the poem. Here, Rosetti drew inspiration from both the verbal and the visual, albeit from very different time periods. 
By contrast, the illustration also departs from Tennyson's word, verse in that it transforms Mariana's look into a passionate gaze while she affectionately kisses Christ's feet. Rossetti adds an ingredient of eroticism and romance to Tennyson's despondent worshiper, Mariana. I would like to turn to my second case study, the illustration for Tennyson's St. Agnes Eve. The underlying theme of a solitary and devoutly religious woman is also present in Millet's design for Tennyson's poem, St. Agnes Eve, engraved by the brothers Dazi. The wood engraving depicts a woman in a loose gown on a turret stair looking out the window. With her right hand, she's holding a lit candle while her left hand rests on the window ledge. Her head is slightly tilted upwards as she gazes at the moon, which brightens up the snow-covered rooftops of the houses outside and illuminates the woman's face and body. The cold air around her makes the water vapor condense, which is discernible in the highly detailed parallel cuts into the wood block made by the engravers. The title of the poem refers to the Feast of St. Agnes on January 21st, when, quote, a maiden who fastened on her eve might see a vision of her destined lover, unquote. According to the legend, St. Agnes was a beautiful young woman born in circa 291 AD, raised in the, Nor in the Roman nobility. She declined all her many suitors and refused to surrender her virginity, openly expressing her devotion to Christ, which ultimately led to her death. She thus becomes a virgin martyr and patron saint of girls. Tennyson's poem, which was first published in 1837, was largely influenced by John Keats's poem, The Eve of St. Agnes, from 1819. In Tennyson's poem, an interior monologue takes place in which the woman assumes a poetic voice. It relates to the euphoric vision of the woman as a lonely nun in a convent looking out the window. Instead of her future husband, however, she finds God or the heavenly bridegroom who shall cleanse her of all sin. The poem has three stanzas of 12 lines each with an alternating rhyming pattern, but lacking a refrain. The first page of the poem, St. Agnes Eve in the Moxon volume, reveals an unbalanced relationship between image and text. The headpiece illustration occupies a large area of the page and is much more prominent than the four lines of the verse that follow. The rectangular frame creates a space within the page into which the viewer is viewed. By positioning the figure of the nun in the center of the picture, Millet allows the viewer to take part in her psychological state. For that, the descriptions taken from the poem that create the poetic imagery are now transformed into the artist's own visual language, according to his own pictorial imagery. The vertical orientation of Linton's wood engravings emphasized by the parallel lines along the center of the winding stairs, the left edge of the window as well, and St. Agnes' long gown. In the process of creating the illustration, Millet had experimented with posture and composition, as can be seen in his three studies in pencil for St. Agnes Eve, made between 1855 and 1856. Two of the designs are more sketchy and schematic, namely the one on the left, depicting the figure standing, and that on the right, in which she's bending forward. By contrast, the drawing in the middle is much more detailed, the woman's face in profile is traced in a slightly thinner outline, revealing her facial traits, as opposed to the other two sketches. Although Millet grew, drew the figure sitting on the staircase, the thorough execution and the attention to detail indicate that the artist had intended, at some point, for this composition to be used for the final drawing, which would then be converted into a wood engraving. This begs the question of whether the engraver would have seen Millet's sketch on the left, in which St. Agnes is standing, in which case he would have had an agency in the choice of design. Alternatively, Millet might have recognized that a standing figure would enhance the sense of verticality in the composition, thereby discarding the design of the woman sitting down. In addition, St. Agnes was supposed to be depicted looking out the window of the convent, for that her head should be turned upwards as she stares at the sky, 
where her heavenly bridegroom will appear to her. Thus, the figure in an upright posture aligns with her deepest wishes to ascend to heaven and join God, as in the poem. When it comes to the scene indoors, the illustration makes three references to the verse. First, the woman's clothes are described in the lines, quote, these white robes are soiled and dark, unquote, and, quote, draw me thy bride a glittering star in raiment white and clean, unquote. Likewise, the figure in the illustration is wearing a white nightgown. Next, the woman's breath is seen in the cold air, which is based upon the words, quote, my breath to heaven like vapor goes, unquote. Thirdly, the turret stairs on which the woman is standing derive from the passage, the shadows of the convents. Regarding the depiction of the outside, the snowy landscape in the picture, it serves both to create an atmosphere and to emphasize the figure's emotion. Like Millet, Tennyson sets the scene as a cold and snowy night. Quote, as are the frosty skies or this first snowdrop of the year, unquote. But that is as far as Millet goes when illustrating the figure's surroundings in the poem. Unlike Millet's picture, Tennyson's story takes place outside of the convent. And uh, there is no visual cues for these golden doors that appear in the poem, gates, nor for the shining sea, all of which impart a dreamlike quality to the setting of the poem. The design, in turn, abandons such attributes to focus on the woman, who is Millet's main, main concern, together with her state of mind and solitude. Overall, both the illustration and the poem make use of the human figure to convey an atmosphere to communicate pictorial or poetic meaning to the viewer reader. However, their approaches serve different purposes. In the case of the poem, the detailed descriptions and adornments of the natural surroundings combine to engage the reader with the nun and her wishes in that particular moment. The illustration, on the other hand, invites the reader to join in the woman's condition by depicting her and the symbolic details that denote the psychology of her inner, inner self. At first, the artist might have envisaged the nun set on the turret stairs in a restful pose, as evidenced by the most detailed drawing out of three compositional sketches produced by Millet. Yet, the wood engraving depicts the figure standing, which could be a sign of the engraver's role in the making of the illustration. This may be regarded as a way of either accentuating the vertical orientation of the picture in purely compositional terms, or metaphorically agreeing with Agnes' wish to go to heaven. While Tennyson's text poetically reinforces the nun's emotions, the illustration allows for an immersion into her psychological state in visual terms. I'd like now to draw a conclusion. In conclusion, the Mox and Tennyson scholarship has tended to place the poetry first when studying its connection with the engravings and the drawings. The objective of the new methodology presented here is the adoption of a visual viewpoint, which allows for an investigation of the relationship between the design and the engraving. For that, it begins with a picture and then continues with a comparison between image and text. The two examples, namely Rosetta's illustration to Marianne in the South and Millet's illustration to St. Agnes Eve, were selected with a view to testing the validity of this methodology, which has the potential to expand and add a visual-based contribution to current approaches to studying the Moxon illustration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Larissa. Um, an interesting way of looking at the thing. I, uh, I quite agree with you. The only interest in Tennyson, Moxon's Tennyson is the illustration of oh, dreary poems. <clears throat> now, um, we've got some questions in the questions and answer. Can you come back live, Elisa? Click your video and um, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Great. Well, again, thank you to both the speakers. I mean, the, the standard, as I said, I'm sure it would be maintained. It most unhesitatingly was. It was splendid. <clears throat> right. First question is uh, for uh, Lisa and is from Dr. Maureen Bell in Birmingham. Hi, Maureen. 
Is there any obvious reason that English productions don't survive as much as those on in continental Europe? Yeah, okay, thanks for this question. It was something that I wished I had the time to address, but of course I didn't. Uh, well, um, Intaglio print uh, uh, makes it necessary to keep print run low uh, as the plates uh, wear out more easily, uh, more rapidly than uh, wood blocks. So this might be a reason uh, for uh, lower print runs that uh, uh, didn't result in uh, high conservation rate, rates. Um, uh, Sheila O'Connell, that I mentioned before, uh, mentioned uh, that uh, Intaglio Printed also made uh, English uh, broadsides more expensive than uh, um, penny prints uh, on the continent. But uh, at the same time, she argued that uh, being printed in a half sheet, they were reasonably um, cheap as well. Um, so one reason uh, might be that even though they were cheap, they were printed in lower print runs, so we don't have uh, so many left. It, it is more likely that uh, the one printed uh, from wood, wood blocks uh, in um, Spain and in the Netherlands and so on had higher print runs. So what we now have are the, the, the broadsides that weren't uh, sold. Uh, there are also many other reasons uh, for conservation uh, that explain conservation rates. Uh, for instance, the fact that many of them had to be used and so distracted in order to, to benefit from them. So it is difficult to understand what survival rates uh, really mean in uh, this context. Um, and uh, yeah, but mainly I would say that uh, uh, also in Italy, for instance, uh, uh, copper plate uh, broadsides were more um, usual and uh, there are also lower survival rates. So it might be the fact that uh, plates uh, wore out more rapidly and so run print runs were lower. I hope I have answered. Thank you, thank you. Now we've got a question from Julia Thomas, who's put it in the uh, chat rather than the question and answer, but we'll we'll forgive you for that, Julia. A fascinating talk from both speakers, thank you. A question for Larissa. To what extent do you see the wood engravings as having more agency in this approach? You're muted. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> okay. Um, I, I think that this is something that hasn't really been been studied um, anyway. So people talk about the illustration as one thing. Um, that that's where uh, I'm trying to uh, detach the two things. So uh, there is evidence that um, the, the the final drawing before the engraving was made is not exactly the same as the final version of the engraving. So there is there is an agent agency there uh, by the engravers and the examples I brought are just two out of 54 illustrations this is a very very um how could I say broad uh, a topic anyway but I think that this is something that is just beginning to be um you know um dealt with I think thank you um now one for uh Elisa again I have two questions. The presentation reminded me of the collection of figures of soldiers in the Musée de l'Armerie in Paris, some made of paper. Were these also popular prints or were they materials aimed at other audiences? And in connection with the above, and perhaps it was mentioned, but I got lost in translation, can any national turn in inverted commas be discerned in the contents of penny prints of lotteries in the 19th century? Uh, before answering that, I, I, I don't know if you're familiar, well, you almost certainly are familiar with the Musée de l'Emerie at um, Pellerin's uh, place in um, Epinal. When I was there a few years ago, I bought a number of their broadsides, and amongst them, I've got a big broadside sheet of half a dozen grenadiers, coloured grenadiers in um, mid-18th century military uniform that clearly, I would imagine, meant to be cut out and put on cardboard for playing soldiers. 
Anyway, an answer uh, Yuan the realised question, yeah, you, okay, rather than you. listening to me reminisce. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I, I'm more familiar with the Pellerin Museum than uh, with the Musée de l'Armée, uh, so I don't really know uh, these, these um, soldiers that uh, uh, Juan you mentioned, uh, but uh, I had a rapid uh, look in Google, and from what I see, uh, they are exactly what, uh, what I mean. Uh, they, they were probably yeah from broadsides uh, and uh, pasted on paper uh, thicker paper and cut out from uh, from from that and as for the second question um I, I think well if you mean national turn meaning how national um, uh themes uh, and uh, mm, yeah uh, um, ideas uh, uh, were uh, if they were uh, in used uh, for uh, yeah in the conception of these uh, sheets broadsides um yes sometimes they were for instance uh, the lottery sheet that uh, i showed about uh, italy uh, has and, and probably this is the this is the reason why you pose this question i don't know i, I just uh, guess uh, you can see that there are national symbols in it, like the flag, uh, the, um, the symbol of uh, the dynasty uh, of uh, the Kingdom of Italy and so on. So yes, actually, I think this, I, I looked at them from a material point of view, an history of children point of view, but they are a, a mine for uh, any study of cultural uh, history uh, related to the masses and uh, the everyday lives of common people. So yeah, I, I can't answer more, but uh, there are traces of this uh, in, uh, in the broadsides. Thanks for the question. I, I, I've seen ex an example of one which was undeniably national, often politically national, if I remember rightly, it was two young boys trapped in Alsace-Lorraine when it was lost to Germany in the Franco-Prussian War, and how uh, glorious it was that they could return to the motherland afterwards. A very, very political uh, thing, you know, not just, well, I suppose, yes, bring the children up to believe what you want them to believe. <laughs> um, there was another one, uh, where was it gone? Larissa. <coughs> What this is from Alan Roche? What do you make of the tension between text and image in Mariana? The letters prioritize text, the poem, and the poem pri prioritizes image, especially in the invocation of Marlowe's Faustus. Quote, in this form she made her moan, then won his praises night and more. And ah, she said, but I wake alone. I sleep forgotten, I wake forlorn. Sounds almost improper. Oh, I think I think there is tension, but there is. I mean, it it, it is a co complex relationship. I think there is not a one answer here. I mean, I'm not I'm not going to talk about Faustus, but I'm just going to mention the the tension between text and te and image. I think that the idea is just um, I try to show a bit the the complexity of this. So it's not just uh, the image. Um, follows the text or the image illustrates the text. I think that we're trying to actually break from this tradition of just seeing the illustration as an illustration of the text that either uh, agrees with the text or goes against the text. So I think that I wouldn't even call it tension. I think that there is a complex relationship of um, agreement um, to different levels and different um, um, to different um, degrees. And so I would, I would leave it as, um, this is a very interesting question to be to be um, thought about. I, I'm sure that there is tension in areas, but uh, not as a whole. I think there it's difficult to, to give a general answer for, for the whole of the text and, and the illustration. Thank you. Uh, another question from uh, Evelyn Verhagen for Elisa. I'm currently working on a lecture for the 30th of May in Ravensburg, the Forum Bildorf Papia, about the so-called follow-up. Uh, Bladen Schneiling, as published by Jan van der Waals about Klaus Jans Bischer in Amsterdam. I think they are precursors of cent print, sort of penny prints. Uh, have you ever looked like that yourself? Looked at that yourself? 
Okay. Uh, no, actually, I've heard about them, but I have never had the opportunity also due to the uh, chronological focus of my research, but uh, uh, I, I would like to know more. And I think, uh, uh, Evelyn, you are the one that, uh, that can uh, uh, tell me more about this. So I would be very happy to get in touch uh, and, uh, and discuss uh, this and uh, your talk and everything. So thank you for this question. We better put Evelyn down as a future hoping speaker, haven't we? I think, yeah. Yes. Um, Larissa from, no, no, I've done dealt with that one. Um, thanks to both Elisa and Larissa for their fascinating talks. My question is for Larissa. I noticed that your examples for the Mox and Tennyson were all specific to pre-Raphaelite illustrations. How would your methodology apply to one of the academic academicians uh, illustrations for this work for example Clarks and Stanfield's tailpiece illustration for St Agnes Eve as compared to Millet's headpiece illustration first I would like to say that I'm honored to be watched today by Lorraine Jensen Koistra uh, I am a you know I, I I have read everything that she has written I am actually blushing now but I have to say you are wherever you are <laughs> wherever you are it is it is a, it is an honor uh, to get an, a question from you. I, I I will I will drink some water and 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 start. <laughs> I'm, I'm just like uh, you know it's just like oh my god it's <laughs> okay uh, okay let me see if I if I can do this right. I don't know whether I'm chairman or referee um, and need to brush okay, on with so smelling I, salts. I, I'm I'm actually uh, 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 humbled, but anyway I will I will say something. I have already done both and uh, just for practice. So I used, I applied my methodology to both illustrations to St. Agnes Eve, Millais, the one that I presented here and uh, Stanfield's, which is a very different one. I decided not to bring it today because I thought that it would be a better comparison with two, two illustrations that more people would have seen just because of that. But of course it could, it, could, it could be used as well. I think the first principle for me is not to really think about this comes from a pre-Raphaelite and this doesn't come from a pre-Raphaelite, but this is an illustration. It is a drawing that has been converted into, a, into an engraving. And now we are looking at the illustration on the page. Within the page, we have a poem and that, that is where I would go. So I think that uh, my, my methodology is basically not to think about whether this is from Millet or, or Rosetti or, or Stanfield, but actually treat this as uh, an illustration. And even things like the vignette uh, or being a, a, a let's say, a, having a frame, I think that they are not really so, so important. Uh, I don't want to actually just focus on specific characteristics so that I can um, control Continue with the bias between uh, you know uh, pre-Raphaelites and non-pre-Raphaelites. My my point of view here is they are they are all um, let's say uh, illustrations on a page and they can be analyzed as such. I think that it's very different because it is basically um, an architecture. So you have a church on top of a of, of a mountain. I mean, if people have seen that, you you will know. And this is the end. It's the tailpiece of the of the of the poem. And it is, it is actually a very interesting thing that uh, now you are not really within, uh, within the, the, the St. Agnes, but you see her actually a very small um, um, kneeling. So it is a very different type of, of illustration, but I wouldn't say it's better or worse or anything. I think that pretty much you could start and analyze in the same way, trying to find points in common. So I would definitely uh, have used that and I have done that. I just decided not to bring the two illustrations for the same poem. But um, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very happy to, to have answered um, may perhaps part of your question. Thank you. Have you recovered your composure? And another question for you from Simon Lake. Um, is there any correspondence revealing historical discussions between artists and engravers during the process of creating engravings from original drawings? Yes, quite a few. Um, I'm not really going to say much about it because this is part of my PhD <laughs> and, and that's what I'm doing. So uh, basically there is, there's quite a lot. Uh, unfortunately, it is not really uh, balanced. So you have a lot more from certain artists and certain engravers, uh, for example, more from the Dazi brothers, more from Linton. 
uh, as opposed to other engravers and other artists. Um, so it's definitely uh, not very um, balanced and even across the board, but there's a lot of interesting, uh, let's say, uh, correspondence there. And I think that this is something that, um, you know, uh, you have to spend some time and look, and uh, it can actually give us a lot of insight into the process of making not only the drawing, but the conversion into the wood engraving. Just replying to somebody, sorry. Uh, it's from Juan, uh, who just says, um, thank you both very much. Fascinating research. And thanks to, also to Hopin, a really special place. Right, uh, back to questions. Um, a question for both speakers. Perhaps can you draw on any publishers' archives that survived to support your analyses and interpretations? Shall I start? Yeah, yeah, you can. Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you very much for this question. Actually, uh, I, my education is in history, so uh, I'm quite used to uh, look uh, into archives. Uh, but I have to say that for these kind of materials, uh, it is uh, uh, sometimes difficult. Uh, there are archives uh, 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 at, um, at the Epinal Center Pelerin. There are there is also something left uh, from the Remondini printers who printed the uh, Italio broadsides uh, in Italy. Uh, I have to say that for cheap print uh, in uh, small booklets, uh, it is easier to uh, draw on archives. Uh, for instance, there are the archives by the um, uh, Trois uh, printer Garnier uh, that have been studied by French cultural historians and still uh, have uh, a lot to, to give to us. Uh, whereas for um, these um, prints, it's uh, sometimes it just uh, for um, you know there is no reason why, but they have not um, they have not been preserved um, due to events, uh, various events, and uh, it's uh, more difficult to to look into archives. Thanks. Have you anything to add to that, Larissa? Um, uh, I'd say ma mainly the archi archives in, in my case, but it's not publisher, it would be the, the, the poet really, uh, Tennyson. And the archives are located in uh, Lincoln. That's where he grew up, he was born. And uh, the, archive, the archives are really, really massive. I have not been there yet uh, due to something called pandemic. Maybe you might've heard, <laughs> but, um, but anyway, uh, this is really, we're talking not only about uh, uh, writings by the author, but correspondence, letters, uh, proofs, even manuscripts. And so I think that this is a good point uh, of, uh, you know, a starting point anyway. Uh, so Tennyson instead of um, the publisher, uh, in, in my case. Thank you. It's my experience that uh, the archives of all publishers seem to be somewhere, but are the ones you want to refer to, and they don't seem to have survived anywhere. And I also find myself wondering how long are we going to be blaming the pandemic for things we haven't quite got round to doing yet. Um, for Elisa, you mentioned children and even adults, but have you considered non-literate members of the inverted commas servant class who were great consumers of images, for example, in encyclopedias? I should also mention Maria Hack's Geological Sketches and Glimpses of Ancient Earth, 1832, a maquette game that sold for three pounds for a very elite set of consumers. Okay, thanks for the question. Yeah, actually, my uh, research focus is on children, so um, that's, that's the reason why I haven't dealt with the uh, servants, but actually, um, I, I know that also in uh, previous studies about um, cheap print in uh, pamphlet, uh, and uh, more narrative uh, forms of cheap prints, uh, they were a sort of um, mediator, if I can call them so, uh, sometimes uh, uh, from, um, I would say, um, between uh, children of upper classes and popular literature, for instance, in uh, reading aloud uh, the, um, the, the stories that, that uh, circulated in chapbooks, for instance, for the children of the families they were working with. So they are surely an interesting uh, part of, uh, of this stories, story, but uh, it's not something that uh, I'm dealing with uh, in, uh, in this project. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, Angela Griffiths writes, thank you very much to both speakers. I find Elisa's discussion very interesting with regard to paper toy theatres and broadsides. There is a modern Irish artist, Jack Yates, who revised both in the early 1900s, um, which is also true of uh, Joseph Crawhall with his chapbook illustrations, wasn't he? That sort of sub that conscious um, antiquing of them. And for Larissa, why do you think such diverse artists selected for Moxon? That's yeah, a good one, I mean, isn't it? It's not, it's not necessarily my, my, only my opinion, but uh, it is in the literature anyway, that um, <laughs> Edward Moxon was a very uh, uh, wise publisher. So he was a very experienced publisher. And uh, he knew that the uh, academicians, so the, the older artists, because they were an older generation, and uh, they were actually beloved by a, a certain, let's say, more conservative group of people, the audience. And then there were those that preferred things that were more, uh, mod, more let's say, um, I, would, I would say something that is more uh, different, innovative. And these were the, the, the pre-Raphaelite uh, artists that were much younger. They were, uh, let's say, belonged to another generation. So he decided to basically cater for all, you know, all types of, of uh, uh, public. So he was very clever in that sense. He thought, well, if I have eight artists instead of three or four, then of course there are more people who will like the book, and then of course uh, more books will sell. So it was a there was this commercial, um, let's say, um, intention uh, behind behind it. Thank you. Another one from. Uh... Lorraine Janssen Christra. I have a question for Elisa. Um, I talk, you talked a bit about the use of chromolithography for the colored broadsides and sheets. Can you say a bit about the use of hand coloring query via stencil of these sheets, especially in England, to create Tuppence colored broadsides on offer? I recall seeing two amazing, ginormous presses in uh, Epinal for um, printing by stencils. Um, did we have anything like that in England? Uh, yeah, okay. I, um, well, I, um, I, I probably showed some uh, um, prints, Dutch prints, uh, where you can clearly see that they were colored by stencil because you can see that uh, there, there are sort of uh, uh, I, I can't think of the word right now. <laughs> spots, spots of colors instead of uh, proper co color coloring. Uh, in um, I, I think uh, I don't know if in English, but in French, uh, there is a sort of uh, way to describe uh, uh, this kind of coloring, calling it. Uh, in the Dutch fashion, uh, which means uh, uh, without uh, care, I would say. And uh, they they were uh, colored by stencil by hand initially, uh, especially by women and uh, children uh, because they were unqualified laborers and could work uh, uh, with this. So it was a, a hand um, application of color by stencil. Um, I have to say that I don't know very much about uh, the application of color by hand in the English uh, lottery prints, but you can clearly see that uh, this was the way the way they did it. And uh, well, I I, pro I think that probably in the audience there are people that are more expert than me on this uh, topic. Uh, but uh, th and you are all as well probably. Uh, thank you for uh, for this uh, question. I seem to recall something um, in. I think it was Holbrook Jackson did a piece on stencil coloring at the Kerwin Press, admittedly in the 1930s, and admittedly of a very high standard. But <clears throat> I'm sure either he or one other writer on the subject mentioned that the girls got so good at it that in the end they could dispense with the stencils okay. and you know colored direct, as it were. Uh, but stencil coloring itself and pushoir is such a fabulous process. Right. Yeah. Now we have a question um, again for um, Larissa from Alan Roche again, who apologizes to start with by saying perhaps too much from me, but no, not at all. Um, would it be seeing too much in the Millet image of St. Agnes to note that the bell structure is quite phallic? Well, um, if I want to be very honest, I think that we could see phallic structures everywhere. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I, I, I'm sorry if I'm going to be very honest here, but I think uh, I was having this conversation with a friend <coughs> lately, 
And um, you could go about and look at felic. I mean, I, I think that we're talking about Victorians. Obviously, there is a there is a repress repressed. Let's say, or you know, it's 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 quite different to, from today. I mean, obviously, I'm I'm, I'm trying to look at this at, as a mid Victorian, you know, uh, volume. So there is this idea that, of course, things cannot really be just there. They have to be hidden. So I'm not saying that there isn't. I I I, I think that um, we we could then claim that there are many other illustrations within the same volume that might have phallic st uh, structures. But one thing that is definitely important about that bell, um, which is in the background, you might not have remembered, I mean, for others, it is a tiny little thing inside a, a house outside the illustration that I showed you, um, the second illustration, is that uh, Millet has another illustration in the volume that is called The Death of the Old Ear. And uh, it is basically inside a house with a bell. So that is something that could be actually related. So you have an illustration of herself looking, and then you have another illustration of within the house. And there is a, within a tower with the, uh, and you see the bell, the bell is actually the protagonist of the story, if you, if you will. So I think that that connection could be made between the two illustrations. Now, where, whereas that is phallic, I will leave it up to your imagination. Brings to mind that Clara Hugh, Didius Felicitas, made himself ridiculous. He thought that a symbol was a phallic symbol, but I digress. Um, Adanda to Lorraine Pistra's question. Um, since Jack Yates was mentioned, I want to indicate my own interest in the hand coloring work by Pamela Coleman Smith, based on the old, older broadside tradition. Pamela Coleman Smith co-edited and hand-colored a broadsheet with Jack Yates, and then went on to create her own hand-colored little magazine associated with the Irish revival movement, The Green Chief in 1903-4. So that might be something to, for one or other to follow up on. Um, just a couple of observations of my own, initially for um, Elisa. You mentioned in passing, um, books of cries or sheets of cries, which seem to have held a, an amazing fascination for children. Are you aware of David Hounslow's uh, S paper, The Moving Market? It's in one of the uh, print networks volumes that I co-edited. In fact, it's in the volume called The Moving Market, where he writes about um, children's books of cries. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head that he talks about any broadsheets. I can't remember. It was a few years ago now, but it might worth worth you while having a look at it. If you can't sort of find the reference, uh, drop me an email and I'll give you the full citation. Okay, and thank you. The, the other thing is you also showed a, a rather sophisticated um, cut up and build model of the Tour Eiffel. Um, I think it was on your last slide. I've noticed when wandering around France, in fact, I've now got a cylinder box with a small collection of them in it. You can buy postcards of famous French buildings or typical French buildings, which you can, should you feel like so doing, cut up and turn into little, little models. But some of us prefer them in postcard format. Uh, that I think has answered all the questions. Uh, the, um, oh yes, there's one from Jacqueline. I'm very interested in the ongoing mentions of toy theatres and other three-dimensional play. Yeah, I, uh, it doesn't, doesn't say Jacqueline who, but it's, um, that's in the chat rather than the question. So I think it's an observation rather than a question, but um, it's very true. Uh, they, they are, and of course, um, the juvenile theatre is a classic example, isn't it? Uh, I mean, what's their names, Reddington's or... No, Pollock still have a shop in Covent Garden, I think, don't they? Well, that seems to have, uh, we seem to have got all the answers and observations in. Oh, this one from Alan, Alan Roche again. Many thanks to very stimulating and thoughtful papers, and I can only say amen to that. <coughs> well, I think that sort of covers everything we've got. We've answered all the questions. So um, if we could all kind of, as it were, give a, a, a sound round of applause, even if none of us can see it, to two excellent speakers who um, really have enlivened the sunny afternoon for me in Cumbria, right? It's been, been too bad. Thank you very much indeed to both of you. Can I hand back to you now, Elena? 
Thank you, Barry. So we'd just like to thank all of the attendees um, for joining <coughs> um, the event. And then we will um, end the webinar there. Um, if there are no further comments. Okay, that's great. So we'll end the webinar there. And thanks again for um, attending and we hope to see you at the next event. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much.